God calls his people to worship a psalm of David, a petition. Hasten, O God, to save me. O Lord, come quickly to help me. May those who seek my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say to me, Aha, aha, turn back because of their shame. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation always say, Let God be exalted. Yet I am poor and needy. Come quickly to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. Let's sing God's praises from hymn number 72. Our scripture reading this morning is from John chapter 18. John chapter 18, verses 12 through 14. And I think you'll see the irony here. Whenever the gospel writers start talking about irony, you can tell about what they're trying to communicate because sometimes they use the irony to really present the truth. John chapter 18, beginning in verse 12 through 14. Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be good if one man died for the people. Bo, can you come lead us in prayer? Well, we now come to that part of the story of Jesus Christ that is most familiar to Christians and non-Christians alike. And there is a very good reason that the crucifixion is placed such a high point for the Christian faith. It's something that Christians do not shy away from. The crucifixion is something that's at the very center of our faith. It lies at the center of our Christian theology as well. So we read about this story in which Jesus Christ came into the world in order to give his life as a ransom for many to save his people from their sins. And we see that all bound up in the events of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Now, in modern Christian culture, the emphasis related to the crucifixion is psychologically driven toward the interest of the individual. And a lot of churches will highlight the story in order to dwell on the details of the pain and the suffering in order to provoke an emotional response among Christians that's uh, involved in a Roman crucifixion and then we use that emotion to pull on the heartstring of believers. And the reality is that Christians tend to sentimentalize the crucifixion in ways that are uh, very familiar to us. We'll take the story of the crucifixion and especially comes full circle when Christians try to visualize a Roman crucifixion and then imagine themselves as the ones who put Jesus there. Very, very common in our day with Christian culture to sort of sentimentalize the whole crucifixion. In fact, I was looking in our hymnal about all the hymns that sing about Christ shedding his blood and without fail, almost every single one of those hymns comes full circle that the blood was availed for me. Okay, if you read our hymnal, you'll see how there's this individualistic emphasis in our hymns that we sing about the blood of Christ. It always comes back to me and my salvation of my sins and it was for my crimes that Jesus was put on the cross. Very, very common in our culture to sort of sentimentalize a story and to sort of emotionalize a story to create a psychological response among Christians. Very, very common. So the conclusion is that what Jesus suffered is what each of us deserve because of our own individual sins against God. And the context here is wholly individual and the effect is psychological. I remember growing up in a very large Baptist church down in Florida where we had an Easter service that was quite a production. And it was kind of a surprise because nobody was told ahead of time what happened. But one Easter Sunday, the, the pastor there preached on the crucifixion, of course, the resurrection as well. And as he was explaining what a Roman crucifixion entailed, the curtain and the baptistry opened up And over the baptistry, behind the podium, was this man on a cross. Imagine everybody's surprise when the curtain opens up as he's explaining what a crucifixion was, and there's this actor on a cross. And he's wearing a thorn crown, and he's got fake blood, you know, coming all off of him in various different ways. And he made it look very, very realistic. And of course, as the preacher told the story of the crucifixion and what kind of death Jesus died, 
All the graphic scene was geared toward an emotional effect on the audience. And the altar call at the end of the service was very, very effective as people streamed down the aisle in tears. Now, I'm not going to say that that approach is entirely wrong. It certainly has certain effects, and I believe that God can use those kinds of things in his own way, in his own time, as he sees fit. But it is odd to me how in this same Baptist church, we spoke adamantly against Roman Catholic Mass and their reenactment of the crucifixion every week. Here we had our live crucifix once a year, our own show. And we had somebody who was actually physically living and breathing up on a cross that we could look to and so we could reenact the crucifixion. And at the same time, us Baptists spoke very, very badly about the Catholics who have their mass every week, crucifying the Lord anew every time. Kind of ironic if you think about it, how Protestants and Catholics end up in a lot of the same ways of thinking for emotional reasons to create a sentimental response. That's why Catholics do the Mass in the way they do it. It's designed to provoke a sentimental, emotional response. And so the psychology is, is being used there to go about accomplish certain theological ends. But again, the emphasis is on the individual and the psychological use of the crucifixion story to stir up sentimentalism as one practical way of building faith. And it's one of those interesting things about how Catholics and Protestants in practice actually agree a great deal. But is that the way the Gospels present the story? When you read the Gospels, do you read a story in which they are highlighting all the pain and suffering in order to provoke a response? Does Mark present this notion that Jesus suffered and died for merely the sins of individual believers? Are we to think that our sins as individuals increased his pain on the cross in that, say, for example, if there were only half as many Christians today as there are, would Jesus' own suffering on the cross be less? How would our life live thousands of years after Jesus affect his suffering at the hands of the Jews and the Romans back then? See, those kinds of questions Those are the kinds of questions that bother me as I evaluate the common sentimental approach to the crucifixion. So I'm going to suggest to you a little different way of going about this, and I think it's much more in line with the way the gospel writers present the story to accomplish their purposes, and I think that this is a better approach because it's more long-lasting than some kind of emotional high, that that's really what Christian culture is after. They're after kind of this sort of emotional... um, self-flatulence that that lasts for a certain point in time can be very effective for a period of time but tends to wear off over time. What the gospel writers knew about this is that there is something else that is more lasting. So let's go into our text now to Mark chapter 15 and we'll begin reading in verse 16 through verse 24 as we pick up our series in Mark. And of course we're picking up after the trial before Pilate where Pilate hands Jesus over to the crowd that desired to have Barabbas released to them and given freedom rather than the king of the Jews. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him, Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. Now, does that account appear to you as intended to arouse sympathy for Jesus or to foment hatred against his enemies? It looks like a pretty bare account to me, sort of like the way we've been looking at all these different accounts. In fact, Mark really doesn't change his style in any way, shape, or form. I don't really believe that the impression is designed by Mark to do this kind of sentimental heartstring pull or some kind of individualistic evaluation of the cross in terms of everyone's own individual sin. In fact, 
he writes in much the same direct way that he's recorded all the other details up to this point. His emphasis is on history, not sentimentalism. He wants to record the accurate details of what's going on with the crucifixion and what actually happened after the Roman trial. Verse 16, the soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. Now what happened here, if you're following in the story, is very much the same thing that happened after this trial or the hearing, more appropriately, at the Sanhedrin. The Roman soldiers began to mock him. They created a scene of a fake coronation. That's really what's going on. They're they're sort of making fun of him by a fake coronation. That's what every king has. Every king has his royal robe. Every king has his crown. And if you read the parallel accounts of the other Gospels, he had a staff for a scepter as well. And so there's this mock coronation going on. Hail, king of the Jews. And that's a lot like what the Jews did back in Mark 14.65. They also mocked Jesus as a false messiah and struck him with their fist and told him to prophesy. And so what is Mark doing with his historical account? He's putting it right next together in what the details of the account are between what the Roman soldiers are doing with Jesus after his trial pilot and what the Jews had done after the trial before the Sanhedrin. They also struck him They also mocked him just like the Jews. And so the Roman soldiers consider it absurd for anyone in their custody to be claimed to be king just as the Jews considered it impossible for the Messiah to be in their prisoner of possession. So both Jew and Gentile worship the same kind of raw power in the end and have the same definition of what it means to be king. The Jews have a certain definition of what it means to be king, the Messiah of Israel, and so do the Romans. Even though they worship at different altars, they still worship the same thing, raw power. That's their definition of what a king is. The Roman soldiers worship Caesar. He was their king. He was God walking on the earth. And the Sanhedrin worshipped a god that was made in Caesar's image. That was the way that they would define the true Messiah. They would only accept the Messiah on their terms, and it would be a Messiah that would be made in Caesar's image as opposed to God's image. So there is no real difference here in the account between the Jew and the Gentile response in their mocking of who Jesus claimed to be. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, and he was mocked by the Jews. Jesus claimed to be the King of the Jews, and he was mocked by the Roman soldiers. Very much the same response here between Jew and Gentile. They had an agreement about what defined kingship in this world. Verse 19, Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. This purple robe could very well be a Roman soldier's cloak. I know they had red cloaks, but also there were variations of colors within the Roman army at very different offices. But the actions here mimic how Roman officials would greet Caesar in person. These Roman officials, whether it be Pilate or other officials, would fall on their knees and call out, Ave Caesar, or Hail Caesar, to offer him homage as their superior. And if you can imagine the scene, you can you could see that Jesus, of course, had already gone through the flogging. He had been beaten to a pulp with the flogging. And so bloody and weak, this scene would highlight the pathetic and ludicrous picture of a king, a bloody and weakened man who could probably barely stand at this point is being mocked as king, all done in jest. And from Mark's point of view, what they thought of as absurd is actually the truth. There's that irony going on here. And Mark has been emphasizing the kingship of Christ throughout the gospel over and over and over in different ways. And this is another way. It's a use of irony here to communicate the truth. And by the way, the Roman soldiers in this part of the world had no particular affinity for the Jews. They looked down on the Jews at this point in time. They were there to sort of keep the Jews under control, and so they would have had a great deal of glee with this. They would have had a great great deal of fun with this, 
this man that claimed to be king of the Jews. Now there's another reason that Mark offers our account is an example that steers clear of sentimentalism and psychological emotionalism. Mark records the history because all of these details are fulfilling prophecy. That's something that he's wanting to communicate for those who know the Old Testament. All of these details are fulfilling prophecy. Places like Isaiah chapter 50. I'm going to, I'm going to read these. Um, these have been recognized by Christians from the very earliest days of the early church as Old Testament prophecies that are fulfilled in the crucifixion. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6. The prophet writes, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Or Isaiah chapter 53, which is really the entire passage, a perfect prophecy of what's going on with Jesus. But Isaiah 53, verses 3 and 4. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Of course, the prophet's talking about Israel there in context. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. When you read that prophecy, the prophet is speaking in terms of corporate salvation here. He's speaking in, he brought us, the nation, the whole body, peace. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we, that is the whole body of Israel, are healed. And so Mark is recording the details in the text of Israel's history in a very plain way to show how the work of the cross that Jesus is doing is fulfilling prophecy and that is something that is more stable, more, more long-lasting as the fulfillment of the word of the prophet than pure sentimental emotionalism. Verse 21, A certain man from Cyrene, Simon the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country and they forced him to carry the cross. Now, soldiers in this day had the right to commandeer the service of local citizens or animals to help them carry baggage. If you remember, they had a rule in the Roman Empire where they could force someone to carry their arms or their certain tools or, or food for the army up to one mile. That's why they had mile posts. They would use the mile posts to measure this. They could force someone to carry things for them for up to one mile. And the best guess of the distance here from the Roman triumph flogging to the place of the skull, which actually is marked, there's actually a church of the sepulcher there. Uh, the best guess is it's about a thousand feet from where Jesus was flogged, just outside the city gate, to the place of the skull. So it's not really that far, but yet... What we see in the story is that Jesus is too weak to proceed and so the Roman soldiers grab Simon as he passes by and commandeers him to carry the cross for Jesus. This would have been the cross beam that they would take and they would insert into the upright beam that was already planted there. And yet Mark presents this as a man named Simon, father of Alexander and Rufus. And so even in this story, Mark is recording someone, a couple of people actually, and probably the father as well, who became believers later and they were known to the churches. And I think there's probably a reason for that. Uh, Mark is, is bringing in a, a sense of optimism here because there's a story of these believers that now are coming into the story. And also they would have been other witnesses to the, eyewitnesses to the fact so that those in the church who wanted to, to double check and confirm Mark's story could go to the eyewitnesses and say, yes, our father was there he saw all these things as well. Being very close to the situation, he would have been another confirming eyewitness and his sons would also pass on that testimony as well in the church. Now in the church history, early church history, there was a group of heretics that had a problem believing that God could die on a cross. And so there was an early heresy, what we call the heresy of docetism, that claimed that Simon took Jesus' place at this point and it was in fact Simon that was crucified on the cross and not Jesus. So be aware of that in history, and actually Muslims believe this as well. My wife and I were traveled over to Ohio a few years ago, and we were riding a taxi in which we met a Muslim taxi driver. 
and we had a, about a 45 minute drive and we had a lot of conversation with us Muslims it was very interesting given our perspective of Zionism and things like that to talk with this Muslim about things over the Middle East and he had a lot of things to say and it was very clear when we told him we were Christians that the big difference that he had as a Muslim was he did not believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross they believed that Christ was a great prophet and so in their thinking it would be improper for a good prophet for God to allow a good prophet to die on a cross at the hands of his enemies and so he had much the same idea as the docetists in the early church history that Simon was the one who took his place and Jesus never actually got up on the cross and so uh, according to Muslims the Roman soldiers never really figured out this switcheroo that went on at the end of the story here with Simon one of those interesting things about the Muslim history so when you if you do have uh, interaction with Muslims recognize that they have that sort of view of the crucifixion it's not Jesus that they believe who went up on the cross it was actually this Simon who took his place verse 22 they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha which means the place of the skull when they offered him wine mixed with myrrh but he did not take it and they crucified him dividing up his clothes they cast lots to see what each would get here Mark records more history that fulfills more prophecy specifically Psalm chapter 69 verse 21 see Mark wants to record these details as plainly as he can and allow those to, who believe in the word of the prophets to see the fulfillment of prophecy Psalm 69 verse 21 they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst and we're going to see also later in the crucifixion how Psalm 22 becomes very very preeminent among the details that are taking place here now some have suggested that the wine mixed with myrrh was a poison offered by the soldiers as an invitation to commit suicide and it does appear that the soldiers are the ones offering this thing this mixture to Jesus others suggest it was offered by the bystanders possibly women to alleviate the suffering sort of a narcotic effect a painkiller yet Jesus turned it down because he was determined to drink the cup of suffering that was placed before him fully and so there were no shortcuts Jesus would act, allow no shortcuts to pulling off his work on the cross Golgotha also according to the text means place of the skull and the common view is that this is a hill outside of Jerusalem that looks like vaguely a place where the top of a skull sort of protrudes out of the ground level and perhaps you know features of a skull that, that, the, that the hill uh, sort of resembles now some have also suggested that it was also the burial place of Goliath's head back in the days of David because in fact if you read the Old Testament this Jerusalem was the city of David and there's a story uh, in, in Jewish tradition about David burying the head of Goliath at this very point now regardless of those details it is clear that Mark brings to mind the skull and so Jesus is crucified on top of a skull as it were if you think of that imagery the cross is placed with Jesus on the cross and it's placed on the place of the skull and I believe that that imagery goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15 and God's promise to Adam and Eve when he cursed the serpent remember God told Adam and Eve and the serpent I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers he will crush your head and you will strike his heel and so this story that begins in Genesis chapter 3 is coming to full climax here as Jesus is placed on the cross at Golgotha being the place of the skull and the cross is piercing the head of the skull and so the seed of the serpent the children of the devil which Jesus called the Pharisees and the teachers of the law he called them a brood of vipers and children of the devil they struck out against Jesus and yet the promised seed of Israel and to Adam and Eve still pierces through the head of the serpent in a very imaginative way with the crucifixion this is the seed of the woman crushing the head of the serpent the skull at the place of the skull being where he places his feet over the head in a sort of very artistic and aesthetic way and there's also an echo of what Jesus the bridegroom does here with the church remember how I told you how what is going on with Jesus in his great tribulation in this particular time of the cross is a miniature great tribulation 
of what was to take place with the early church in their generation. And that's something very much similar here with Jesus crushing the head of the serpent and being the bridegroom, he goes first. And then we also find out in Romans 16.20 that Paul talks about that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, speaking of the church. And so there's first the bridegroom and his work of crushing the head of the serpent and then also in Romans chapter 16, this this imminent uh, uh, about to be fulfillment of the church crushing the head of Satan under their feet. So there's a parallel here, just like the Great Tribulation, sort of an echo effect between the work of Christ and the work of the early church. And by the way, the reference to the skull is not the only allusion back to the early chapters of Genesis here. When you read this, think about all the connections it makes back to Genesis chapter 3. Jesus wore a crown of thorns. Thorns are an aspect of the curse. Back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 18. Jesus had already sweat great drops, of, uh, as it were, of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so sweat is also bound up in this trial, in this work of Christ. He would also be put up on the cross naked. Verse 24. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would get. So Jesus is becoming like Adam here in his sin. He's being tortured by thorns. He's sweating from the night in which he was betrayed. He is becoming naked. And the imagery is pointing out that Jesus is becoming the curse for his people. That's going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. All these things are are sort of uh, images and pictures of what Jesus is undergoing. And I believe that comes to a climax at his death all of these allusions to Genesis chapter 3 are symbolic in a sense of the ultimate curse of being cut off from the presence of God. And we're going to see how that takes place at his death. Yet even the casting of Lot for his clothes had significance. So as Jesus is being unrobed, because they crucify people naked. And by the way, the example of the actor in my Baptist church, it was one of those details that they fudged. They didn't exactly crucify him fully naked. He was topless, but they had clothes on. So they used some license to uh, change the story just a bit. But this is remarkably relevant because here Jesus is naked. He is the seed of the woman and he has the sign of the covenant on his foreskin. And so as he is disrobed, he is shown to the whole world as the seed of the woman with a sign of the covenant in full display. So it's not just a matter of bearing up and becoming the curse like Adam. There's also a covenant significance to this and what's being shown to the world. And I think even the casting of lots for his clothes had significance. The robe represents the kingdom in some way. And just like the priest's robe represented the priesthood, we saw that according to the law, the high priest was never to tear his clothes. Well, now you have an example of Jesus' clothes sort of being gambled upon. And so think of it, a great irony here that the Roman soldiers are divvying up Jesus' clothes. As Jesus' plain and normal clothing goes to the soldiers, so would Israel's plain and normal kingdom be divvied up by Rome's imperial army within one generation. And so what's going on here is a foreshadowing of what's to come a little bit later. What the Jewish leadership had decreed for Jesus would come back on their own heads as national Israel would also be stripped naked and executed at the hands of Roman soldiers. Now, I didn't want to hurry through this text of the crucifixion because it's packed with so much detail. Uh, We'll look more into the details of the crucifixion in the coming weeks, but for now I want to suggest a better way for us to think about the crucifixion. Rather than seeing the crucifixion, in its sentimental terms related to our own individual emotional feelings, consider this. Neither Mark nor any of the other gospel writers communicate the story as if pain and suffering that Jesus bore was primarily for individuals who happened to believe on his name throughout history and throughout all ages. The gospel writers really don't present the story in that light. Our theology, as it's built up over the generations, has forced us to sort of take the story and run with it in that direction. And if you live in a very self-centered culture like we live today, it's very natural for things to go that direction as well because everyone is so fixated upon their own selves and their own interests. 
But what you find is a sober account that highlights the history in covenant context. So this is an extension of what I've been hammering at for my entire series. This is all about covenant context here. That's what Mark is getting across. This death would bring about the salvation of Israel. It's not merely about individuals. It's about the corporate body for whom Christ died. Remember the prophecy of the high priest? It is good for one man to die for the nation. Great irony in that, but it's actually true. Christ died for the nation. And I will suggest to you that when Christians reduce the crucifixion to be related primarily to individuals in a sentimentalized emotionalism, then the focus becomes upon us. The focus becomes upon our sin. We make the story into our image and make man the center. But the apostles did something very different. They focused on the history in covenant context. Why? Because the history is objective. The history is there no matter what I feel. The fulfillment of prophecy is indisputable based on the testimony of witnesses. It's more reliable than our own feelings. It's outside the dominion of human emotions or psychological manipulation. And so the history sits there and it speaks a word not about us, but a word about God and what he does for his people whom he loves. This story is ultimately about the personality of God, not our own emotions, not our own sin. This is the kind of person that God is. This is the God who would go to such lengths to send his only son to become a ransom for many. And Christians often miss that when they wallow in their self-centered, individualistic sentimentalism. The cross reveals to us the knowledge of God. He is holy and just, yet merciful and loving all at the same time and you can't break those things up into theological distinctions that separate themselves out holy and just because he requires a penalty for the sin of Adam ultimately that's what we're talking about here Jesus is redeeming Israel from the sin of Adam in the crucifixion and yet he loves his people and his holy nation of priests and kings so much that he is willing to do this to redeem true Israel. So my challenge to you is stop thinking how much pain and suffering your sins caused Jesus to come on him at the cross and start realizing what kind of person God is who is willing to die once for all so that he may live forever with his people. And as we enter the body of Christ, that's where the individual side of it comes into play. We enter into the body of Christ, the true nation of Israel, by faith. Our sins are covered through Christ's offering, through Christ, the head over all of us in the true nation of Israel, the Israel of God. And so consider how the crucifixion tells us a lot more about God than it does about ourselves. Let's pray. Father, you have made us, you've breathed life into us, You've caused us to stand up and walk. Lord, we thank you for a great God you are to us, for saving us out of the mire, for redeeming us from the curse through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, you've made us to be a nation of priests and kings. We pray that you would give us wisdom and strength to accept that calling, to do the work that you've set before us as your nation of priests and kings. May we minister the gospel to those around us as part of the body, always cognizant of our place in the world that you have put us, in the jobs that we have specifically for us as we fit into the wider context of your body, your temple, and your holy people. Lord, we just lift up the church to you this afternoon that you would bless her and strengthen her, give her wisdom to deal with the challenges against your kingdom that come upon the church in various different parts of the world. We pray for believers in Egypt this morning as they also are going through this difficult time in their particular country. Pray for uh, preservation on them in whatever the outcome of that situation is. Lord, we just pray for your kingdom that it might go forth and that it might show the kind of rule that you have in mind through the gospel, through deeds of justice and mercy and righteousness. Your kingdom is extended. Others are drawn to you in covenant life and health. Lord, we pray for your blessing on us as a fellowship together as a congregation. Even though we are many, we are one in Christ. 
And we thank you for the work that you have done in this congregation. In Jesus Christ's name we pray these things. Amen.